Hi, I'm Beth Faber from the Hydrologic Engineering Center, and this is part one of the lecture on uncertainty and frequency estimates. This is the eighth lecture in the Statistical Methods and Hydrology course. This lecture will be divided into four parts, and so you should find four videos for this lecture. Before I even show an outline, I'm going to start with some motivation for the topic. All right, so here's something you've seen a bit of this week already. This is an annual peak flow frequency analysis with 50 something years of data uh, in red um, with our annual peak flows plotted against plotting positions in red and in black we have a fitted probability distribution which is the model for probability for this data. All right, so how do you feel about this analysis? Is this, is this a good fit? All right, it seems to fit pretty well. Um, across most of the data set. It's a little bit low at the top. Uh, it doesn't quite reach the high values. And so the model might have predicted that um, the, the largest flows in this period of time might have been a little bit lower, right? Uh, same to less uh, extent at the bottom. But overall, this kind of seems like a pretty good fit. You know, as engineers and scientists, if we have uh, this kind of agreement between our data and our model, we generally feel pretty good about it. And what I'd like to do in this lecture, um, and especially in this first part, is I would like to ruin that good feeling that you might have looking at this. Okay? I would like to, um, yeah, I'd like to just quash that feeling and have you feel less good about this uh, frequency analysis and, uh, and the result. Okay? So how am I going to do that? Well, let's try. We're going to do uh, a Monte Carlo simulation, uh, similar to what we did in the last lecture and what we did in the introductory lecture, where we're going to uh, specify a known probability distribution, and we're going to randomly sample values from it and then try to re-estimate that probability distribution. So I've specified a log Pearson type 3 distribution with the parameters shown here, mean of 4, standard deviation of 0.5, skew of of 0.4, and I'm going to read, uh, randomly sample 1,000 values from this distribution, right? So here's 1,000 values. So I'm going to think of these as 1,000 annual maximum flows, and so this is like having 1,000 years of data, right? However, in this, uh, in this experiment, all of the assumptions of our frequency analysis are true, right, because of how we did it. So our IID assumptions are true. This data really is independent, and each value really is identically distributed. They literally all come from this probability distribution all the way across the 1,000 years of data. And also, when I refit uh, a distribution to this data, I'm going to refit a log Pearson type 3, right? So that means that the distribution I'm fitting is actually also correct. So for my experiment, all of the assumptions of frequency analysis are true, and so this is truly a best case. Any uncertainty that we see in this experiment is going to be less than the uncertainty truly is in reality. Right. Now, since I plotted flow on the linear axis, I'm going to redraw my probability distribution also with a linear axis, so you can line up this distribution to the flows that we're seeing here. So first, let's see if this 1,000-year uh, data set is representative of the population as a whole, right, where the population is my um, known frequency curve. So the 1% flow value uh, is about 200,000 CFS, and we would expect uh, 1,000 years of data to exceed the 100-year value about 10 times, and we have, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, we can count him, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, right? So it's a little bit more, right? 11 in 1,000 years, but that's, that's pretty close. Um, the 500-year event is up here, and we have won two exceedances in our 1,000 years, and that seems right. Um, I've also plotted a 25-year event. I'm not going to count them, but we would expect uh, 40 exceedances in 1,000 years, and I believe we have 37, maybe 38 exceedances. So this is a pretty uh, decent uh, representation. It's a pretty representative sample. Okay. So what I'm going to do next is moving from the beginning uh, through uh, to the end, I'm going to re-estimate my uh, sample moments with every additional year. Okay. So here we have the mean in green. I've actually plotted the mean minus 4, so the mean would plot at 0 on this log flow axis, just so I could zoom the axis a little bit tighter. So the mean should plot at 0. Uh, the solid line is my estimate of the mean as I 
continue adding data points and the dashed line is the true value. Standard deviation is pink with the true value of 0.5 and the dashed line at that level and the computed standard deviation here as the solid pink. And then finally, skew coefficient is in light blue, where that true value is at 0.4, and the computed value is all over the place. So um, not surprising uh, that the skew is, is pretty bad. Down here, we have uh, blown up the first 250 years. And we can see that the mean is kind of uh, getting to the right answer at about 50 years or so with a little bobble at 100. Uh, the standard deviation in pink is taking maybe about 100 years uh, to get to the right answer and, uh, and then staying there. And the skew coefficient really is not there by the 250. So let's go back up to the 1,000. And the skew coefficient is taking about 700, 750 years to get to the population value. All right, so it takes... It takes a long time to get the skew coefficient right. And so it's going to take a long time before we can get a good estimate of our population frequency curve. But let's go ahead and do that next. Let's uh, fit the frequency curve using these parameters at each event along the way. So I'm going to add the estimated 1% event as a yellow line to this curve and also an estimated 4% uh, event or 25 year. Right, so now the curve is getting uh, a little crowded, and uh, in the next slide, I'll drop off everything except the 1% event. But let's look at them together for a moment. So the 1% event is in yellow, and as we can see in terms of how long it takes to settle into the population value, it's quite similar to the skew coefficient in that it's taking into 700, 750 years. And the reason for that is the 1% value at the upper end of the frequency curve is really sensitive to the skew coefficient, right? The skew coefficient, especially this positive skew, gives us an upward curvature to the frequency curve. And as that value changes and the upper end of the frequency curve changes and the 1% value will move around quite a lot, right? So the skew coefficient um, being as volatile as it is uh, means the 1% value will be volatile as well. The 25 year event down here in orange settles in a bit quicker to maybe 250 years so now I'm going to uh, go ahead and drop off everything but the 1% event, right, to make the curve a little bit clearer, right? So um, let's look at what's going on here. What's happening with this estimate of the 1% event? Well, every time we have a large event, our skew coefficient is going to go way up, and, and our mean and our standard deviation will go up as well. And so our 1% event estimate shoots up every time we have a big event, right? So here's this first one. It shoots up with this one, shoots up again with this one shoots up with this big event. Sometimes it's moving closer to the right answer. Sometimes it's moving farther away from the right answer. Right? Each time we have a big event, um, our estimate of the 1% event is going to go up. So uh, think about when we usually recompute our frequency curves. Um, usually we'll recompute them after a big event happens. Right? Because we want to have an estimate of what the likelihood of that big event was. So when we recompute our frequency curves after a big event, we just have to recognize that we're going to be computing these high points. And even though the estimate goes down over the following years after a big event, right? as no big events are happening, our estimate will go down. It's going to go up again with the next big event. So we just have to recognize that we're getting these high points and not these uh, lower estimates. Okay? Um, now, if we get to the later part of the record, uh, we've got some really big events here, and the curve, uh, the estimate of the 1% event really isn't changing all that much. And, and what's going on there? Well, the, these aren't moving as much because there's already so much data included in the estimate. Right? We can think of this like our college GPA. And back here, it's like your freshman year, uh, year GPA, where every class and every grade affects your um, average GPA quite a lot. And over here is kind of your senior year GPA, and any class uh, and any grade is not going to move at all that much, right? So unfortunately, we are kind of always in freshman year here when it comes to doing frequency analysis, right? So this thousand years, if we think of this as a thousand years, is this looking like we expect a real thousand year period to look. Uh, we have some uh, events here where we have a couple of big events that happen somewhat near each other, and we have long periods of time where we don't have big events. Is that realistic? And in fact, even though we might 
um, we might first expect to have um, the, the range of values kind of evenly uh, appearing across a time period. In fact, random data really has um, what's called clustering where we have extreme values that do, do occur close together and we have an absence of extreme values for long periods of time. And this clustering is what happens with, with random outcomes. And if you're a gambler, you've seen this where there's kind of hot streaks and cold streaks, right? So this is maybe what a thousand year period could look like even in the absence of any kind of climate change or uh, cycling. Right, this does not have any cycling. This is purely random data from this probability distribution, right? Every value from it. Okay, so this is like a thousand year period, maybe from sometime in the past to sometime in the future. We generally don't see enough data. We don't get hundreds of years of data so we can zoom in on the right answer. Um, we're lucky to get maybe 100 years of data. So let's consider when in this thousand year record that we and our gauge on the stream might have existed. What if we observed this period here from 650 to 750, right? If this was the data that we observed, then we've seen a lot of big floods. You know, we're gonna think big floods are actually very likely. If we were to sit a, fit a frequency curve to this data, our estimate of the 1% event would be quite high, right? And our estimate of the likelihood of this 200,000 CFS would also be a, quite a high probability, right? We think big floods are just no big deal if we live here. In fact, perhaps we've developed a little bit further away from the river if this was the time that we observed. What if instead though, what if instead the period of time that we had observed in this record was from about, let's say 325 to 425, right? If we observe this period in here, then we haven't seen any big events. And we probably think big flood events are really unlikely. Maybe they're not even imaginable, right? If we fit a frequency curve to this data, the estimate of the 1% event is gonna be quite low. And if we even extrapolate it out to this 200,000, we might think that uh, it, it is extremely unlikely. If we extrapolate out that far, we'll get a fairly small probability, right? So what's the problem there? Why is that happening? Well, the problem is that those two pieces of the record, those two samples were not representative of the population. And if we look across this data set, there are a lot of periods of time in this data set where the sample, the limited sample that we might observe is just not representative of the population. It doesn't make the values wrong, it just means that as a sample, they don't capture the population, they don't represent the population that well. Right, so let's look at this a little bit differently. Uh, we do think of a, th a hundred years of data to be a lot, and that's the reason that I had these red lines here drawn at about a hundred years. Let's move instead of accumulating our data across the time uh, window. Let's use a 100 year window all the way across, okay? Right. So here's the width of a 100 year window and I'm going to compute my frequency curve with that window moving all the way across the record. So my first uh, estimate is here at year 100 and it's based on the 100 years before it. And as I move across the record, I'm adding a year and dropping a year with each. And so you can see here's where we add in this big event and then moving uh, across, here's where we drop out that big event. And uh, moving further, here's that low period we observed and here's that high period we observed. And so we can see how extreme our 1% event would have been at year 425, it would have been half the actual value, and at year 750, uh, it would have been almost double. And in fact, there is a period, had we chosen it, uh, that we would have been more than double the actual. So if we stand back and look at this entire range, we're seeing the range of uncertainty in frequency estimates, or we're seeing the range of the incorrect estimate we might have had from a, an unrepresentative sample during this period, right? And 100 years is actually a very good length of data set for us. Usually we have a lot less data, maybe only 50 years. So let's look at the same thing with a 50 year moving window, right? Now with only 50 years going into each of our estimates, they vary even farther from the actual value at 200,000, uh, enough that they even come off the, come off the chart so our uncertainty with only 50 years of data is gonna be wider than our uncertainty was with 100 years of data.
Okay. So now let's consider we looked at a frequency curve with a positive skew coefficient, which means the curve uh, curves upward. And maybe being so steep at the upper end is one of the contributors to how much uncertainty there is. And there's a lot of locations that have a negative skew in log space. So let's go ahead and look at uncertainty with a negatively skewed distribution. So we started with our blue curve here with a positive skew in log space. And I'm going to look at a negative um, 0.4. Um, so negatively skewed in log space. Now down here on the linear axis, they both are positively skewed in linear space, but you can see everything's quite a bit smaller and less steep at the upper end here with the red curve with the negative log space skew. Right, so I'm going to use the same random numbers to sample from this red distribution. Right, so our original sample from the blue distribution is up top, and our sample from the red distribution with the same random numbers in the same order is down below. Right. So as you can see, now we have a lower 1% uh, flow estimate at a little over 100,000, and it does look like our uncertainty is quite a bit less. Right. And in fact, it is quite a bit less, although not uh, quite as little as it looks, because if we really did have this data set, we wouldn't be plotting the axis up to 500,000 CFS. So we'd be plotting it more like this. And so relative to the magnitude of events, we do still have quite a bit of uncertainty and more than we probably would have expected, even with these 100 year samples. Um, so back to our frequency curve. I'm hoping that now you feel a little bit less confident about this being the right frequency curve, right? Is, is it right? Well, it's a very good fit to the data that we have, but whether or not it is the population frequency curve or a good estimate of the population frequency curve, it all depends on whether this sample is representative of the population. And we don't know. And because we don't know, we acknowledge the uncertainty that we get from having a limited size sample. So we describe that uncertainty with these probability distributions going across the curve. So these are PDFs or probability density functions and you should imagine them coming out of the page on a z-axis and they describe the uncertainty that we might see uh, at each um, it would be very narrow in the middle of the frequency curve, and it's a bit wider out here at the tails that I've drawn. Now, this looks um, narrower than we saw on the previous screen, and that's because I'm back in log space, right? But this is still actually as wide as we saw with that uh, data set um, that I used to build the thousand years. So note that this is positively skewed, which means the uncertainty reaches a little higher uh, on the top end of the curve, and then at the low end of the curve, the uncertainty is negatively skewed, and so it reaches a little bit further down than up. Now, because uh, the area under the PDF is the description of our probability, we can span 90% of the middle of these curves and draw a 90% confidence interval at each point along the curve. Right. The 90% confidence interval is just a simpler depiction of the uncertainty, although uh, it has a little bit less information to it. But looking at the 90% confidence interval at the same time as the PDFs, we can be reminded that the 90% confidence interval um, is what we hope spans. Uh, we hope we have a 90% likelihood when we draw those of spanning the right answer, but it's still much more likely for the right answer to be close to the um, to the original. Uh, estimate where the curve is higher and it's a little bit less likely to be out here at the tails. Right, so this is how we describe our, um, our uncertainty. Right, so a little summary of what we've just discussed. So the uncertainty uh, definition is uncertainty is the degree to which we're unsure of an estimate quantified by an estimated error. The estimated error is often stated in terms of an interval, like that 90% confidence interval, but more completely defined by a sampling distribution. And we'll talk about sampling distributions later in this talk. If you're not familiar with them yet, I'll be starting kind of slow on building sampling distributions and what they mean. All right, so to summarize that, the uncertainty in the frequency curve is partially driven by whether the sample is representative of the population. And I say partially driven, I might even really mean mostly driven, but there are other contributors to the uncertainty that we'll talk about in this lecture as well. Okay, so the purpose of this lecture is to understand the causes of uncertainty in estimating a frequency curve or any other probability distribution. Uh, we'll become familiar with uncertainty in each aspect of the estimation and um, to understand the confidence interval and the uncertainty distribution around our frequency curves.
right? So finally, here's our topics. Uh, we started with the motivation, and I hope you're now motivated uh, to recognize that um, we are uncertain. Um, then we're going to talk about contributing factors. We've already seen those, but we'll just discuss them real quickly. Then we'll talk about quantifying sampling error, and I'll show sampling distributions and also confidence intervals that are based on sampling distributions. Okay, then we'll go on to specifically uncertainty in the frequency estimates, um, both for analytical and graphical distributions. And within analytical, we'll talk a little bit about expected probability. So the way I'm going to break up the topics into the four videos, this first video was the motivation, uh, the second video will cover these topics, the third will cover these, and the fourth will cover the last. Okay, so that was the end of the first video, and I'll see you in video two.